So this is a collaboration workshop between a few different clubs. Um, this AI at UCF, which I'm here to represent. We got the, the Google Developer Student Club. Yes. Uh, so if you're part of either club, welcome. If you're not part of either club, you should join them because they're great. <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, and we, you know, we work on, we do somewhat different things, but there's a lot of things that overlap. Like for example, this involves AI and kind of like, you know, hands-on technical applications. Uh, so we thought it'd be a great opportunity. Yes, yeah, so has everybody got the QR code? Anybody need more time? Any more time, Asia? No, I'm just saying, like, the QR code, like, the link is showing is kind of, uh, I don't think it's supposed to be like that. It's not there. 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 Well, that's what they show. That's the extension. Interesting. All right. If anything, what you guys can do is just send out the link. Yeah, we'll uh, send out the link. So uh, actually, if you have it, if you can find it, you can post it in the Zoom chat. And then, yeah, can you send that to me in Discord? I can do it in the Zoom chat. Uh, I don't right, know so which link it is. Oh, yeah. the, uh, QR code then. <laughs> All right. So uh, maybe next time. For yeah, I'll, I'll get into it. So this is a workshop made by someone else. Someone else made these slides. His name is Jason Mays. He's a senior DRE, which I'm not actually 100% sure what that stands for, uh, but he's an engineer at Google. Uh, for TensorFlow, and he made this workshop, and we're here to kind of present it and, you know, talk about it. So, without further ado, oh, All right. actually, yeah, so let's just, um, just one quick thing about the GDSC. So, if you are here from the GDSC, you've probably heard this Google program. If you're not, if you're from the AI, AI Club, um, then Google Developer Student Clubs are a student-run organization, um, kind of sponsored and aided by Google, um, officially recognized by Google. Uh, it's a great way to get into various technologies. We host workshops like this. We do a lot of other different things with Google and non-Google technologies. Um, and it's a really good thing to have on a resume to be able to say that you worked with a specific Google um, program. Then there are also different programs that kind of fall under the same branches as GDSC, such as uh, Google Developer Groups, and the Tech Makers, um, and yeah. Awesome. And as for what we're going to end up using today, we're going to use TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is pretty much free and open source uh, like framework, or you can say library, that's primarily used in Python. Most people use Python, they can use C++, Java, and Python, like I said. And uh, one of the great things about it is that you can implement neural networks, any sort of machine learning models with it. And specifically in this workshop, we're going to end up using it for computer vision applications. So that's, uh, there's things like segmentation, uh, maybe classification of different things using, like like we said, for a computer and a and a webcam. So that's kind of what we're going to have to do in this workshop. So hope you guys can enjoy that. Cool. Yeah, I'd like to <clears throat> maybe kind of like focus on, uh, emphasize something which I think is somewhat important. Who here can maybe tell me what a library is? Like, what is a, li a code library? And if you're in Zoom, you can type it in the chat. We'll see it. Yeah. Um, so it's fine if you don't know, which that's, that's what we're here to do is teach. Um, so a library is essentially a piece of code or usually a long work of code that someone else wrote for others to use. So you may think, you know, um, oh, you, you've done your, your CS1 assignments or your intro to C assignments. And usually you just start off with a blank page and you start typing in and you code everything from scratch. Um, in the real world, you know, if every software engineer is having to code every single thing from scratch, it's really hard to, to kind of like work together and, and advance. So the idea is that somebody can write, you know, a library of code like TensorFlow, um, like any object, if you, if you know object-oriented programming, any object of code that comes with like some a list of variables and functions, et cetera. And then someone else can just import your library, import all of that code and build on top of it. So they can call the functions that you already implemented to build something that's that uses that to do something else. Um, so like this is the library that we're gonna be using. It's open source, which means it's, it's available for free. Um, and you can just find it, just Google it on the internet. Um, so to start off with this workshop, we're going to be following the code lab. Uh, so everybody open this web page on your laptop if you want to follow along. 
Um, this is codelabs.developers.google.com. And I'm also going to be following along with you all so that you can see, you know, step by step all the things that we're going to be doing. So you should come to a web page that looks like this. And next, you will want to search for tensorflow.js, which uh, I found that using this search bar, you actually, it doesn't come up like it's one of the top search results. So try to use the search bar at the top and just search tensorflow.js. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to want to do is click this third link, make a smart webcam in JavaScript with the TensorFlow. Um, and it should start you off at number one with the, just before you begin prerequisites. Um, and this code lab is essentially like a write-up of everything that's in the PowerPoint. So I'll just be switching back and forth between both of them. Um, so as you can see, it says here to click on that and to follow along. So what we're actually going to be creating in this workshop so that, you know, like what, what skill are you going to get out of this? Um, you're going to be able to build a camera that can identify objects in an image. And so you can see exactly like it's doing here, you know, given the people in that image and the dog, it can actually not just identify that there is one present, but also draw a bounding box exactly around where it thinks it is and give you the level of confidence that the model has for um, how likely it thinks that that is actually the object. Um, and here we're using the word object very loosely, you know, it's just uh, any kind of like possible thing that could be in, a, in an image, like a person and dog, not necessarily does it have to be like a, an item. Um, and so you might look at this and be like, okay, that looks cool, you know. Um, and so the idea is that we're going to give you this skill and given this, it's up to you and your creativity to find out what you can do with this. Um, so, you know, after this, just identifying objects, um, you can use your own creativity. You know, you could use this um, as a show an example here in the PowerPoint uh, to detect, you know, if you set up a camera in your house, you could detect when your dog is coming near your food um, and have it automatically register and then, you know, maybe send you a text whenever your dog eats your food or something like that. Um, and even you know, more globally applicable. I've seen like a, I saw a video a few years ago um, of someone who used an object detection algorithm to identify whether there was a gun present in like a security camera footage. Um, and you could think, okay, that's that could be very helpful, you know, not having to have someone sitting there looking at a bunch of different security cameras. Uh, if we have an AI algorithm that can automatically detect stuff like that, you can possibly, you know, save someone's life even. Um, so it's up to you to figure out what you want to build on top of this and use your creativity. So let's get started. Um, so what we're going to do is build a web page, a very simple web page. We're not going to go into like anything too complex because the idea is just about getting the smart cam to work. Um, but the reason we're doing it in a web page is because it's very accessible. You know, if if you put something on a web page, then you can access it from a phone, from a computer, from a Raspberry Pi, et cetera. Put it on a resume. Yeah, and you can easily put it on a resume. If it's like, hey, just click on this link and you can see the thing I built. So uh, it's, it's very universal. Um, and drawing bounding boxes like we talked about. And these are the things you'll learn how to load a pre-trained model, which I'll talk a little bit more about, grabbing data from a webcam stream, classifying, and highlighting the objects. Um, and I know we, we mentioned, you know, what TensorFlow is, it's the open source library, and it's specifically written in JavaScript, which is kind of like the language of web pages, of browsers, um, et cetera. And, uh, TensorFlow itself has been implemented in many different languages. Um, and what it allows you to do is run existing machine learning models that have already been prepackaged into it, 
like the one that we're going to use for object detection, we're not going to be training our own model. There's a model that someone else has already written and trained, and we're just going to be implementing that model to do the object detection. Um, but you can also do uh, this thing called transfer learning, which is like taking uh, data from one model and applying it to another model. And you can even write your own models from scratch uh, using TensorFlow. So it kind of, it, it gives you all of those layers is like, if you want to work on something very specific, like uh, you want to change the exact parameters of a neural network for something, you can, but if you just want to like, you know, use something for a project, you can already use some kind of prepackaged code that's more abstract and just implement it. Um, yeah, and then um, yeah. kind of going, I guess, taking a step back, just in case anybody here is like really, really new to AI and they want to learn, um, they don't really have any experience with it yet. Um, when he refers to a model, he's just referring to uh, the way AI works is like it looks at a bunch of training data and it gets tons and tons and tons of examples of a certain um, input and desired output. Um, and then it learns from these examples using a bunch of uh, neurons, a bunch of math and things like that. So a model is basically just a set of training data that has already been processed through the um, through the AI and it, it kind of knows what to do with this data. So it's a trained model is kind of the AI already knows what to do with this specific input. Um, and so then you can give it a new input and it'll be able to guess what the output should be. Yeah, that's, that's a great description of what a model is. Um, and so, like I said, you know, Using JavaScript, we can have some networks in a browser, on a server, mobile, given all of these like, you know, frameworks or um, implementations of it. Uh, so it's, it's just going to be very universal and that's always helpful. Um, and this is actually going to be using the machine learning in the client side, which just means on your actual computer. So you may always think that everything always happens on your computer, but that's actually not true. So like if you have a smart home device, you know, it's usually a very small thing. It doesn't have a lot of processing power. So for the smart home device, what they'll usually do is they'll take your speech and actually send it over to Google or Amazon servers. They'll process that data on a really fast supercomputer and then send the results back to you. So kind of like the process, the main bulk of the processing doesn't actually happen on your client. It happens on the server. Um, but implementing something on your client gives you a few advantages. There's some disadvantages, but the advantages are you get high privacy. You know, you know that your data is staying on your computer. It's not being sent anywhere else. Um, low latency, you don't need an internet connection because you're not talking to any other servers. It's just your computer. Um, and you can reach and scale it to the web if you want to. And there's the lower serving cost because you don't, you know, you don't need to run a bunch of servers in a data center somewhere across the world to do this. Um, and they also support server side and other stuff. Um, so, you know, a little bit more background, like I said, is that the TensorFlow allows you to go from working very broadly to working on very specific stuffs. Um, it just depends on your use case and your needs. Um, so using pre-trained models or going into the individual layers of those models or changing, you know, very even specific parameters. Um, so you can think of, let's see if I look at like a neural network. This is just to give you a picture of what we're talking about. You know, these are neural networks. Um, let me give this one as an example. Um, so this entire thing would be a model. This is like you have some inputs that come in here and you have your outputs. So in our example for the smart camera, what's going to be the input? Yeah. Uh, the actual like, image. Yeah, the, the video, the image, you know. That's going to be our input. And what is going to be the output? Yeah? Uh, like, what is trying to detect a person? Um, do we showing like anything that it needs to look for? Or what's like, should look for, it looks for? Yeah, exactly. So, as well as um, one of the things that I mentioned on the previous slide, too, is a bounding box of where each specific thing is. Because you can have multiple things in an image, and it knows exactly 
um, where it is and how big it is. So if you have like a dog over here and then you have a person over here, it'd be able to say like, okay, the person's bigger and the dog is over in the corner. It's small. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot about them. Yes. Yeah. And so this kind of like layers that they're talking about is like, you know, we could, what we're going to do is we're going to take a model that already exists and use it. But we could, if we wanted to, you know, go into the individual layers and change, you know, oh, I want to use a model with this many different layers. So each vertical column of nodes is a layer here. Um, and e go even further and talk about, you know, like changing individual things within the model. Um, as well as, yeah, so here they just talk about a little bit about like some backends. We got the client and server side, which can be implemented using various different uh, libraries and hardware. Uh, not too important for the purposes of the workshop. So <clears throat> like we mentioned before, there can be pre-trained models for pretty much anything. They have vision, the human body, which it's kind of a subset of vision because usually you're detecting a human body via vision. Um, classifying text, you know, like automatically looking at a paragraph that someone wrote and determining whether it's got positive sentiment or negative sentiment. We got speech recognition and just other things. So it's very helpful to use a model that someone's already done because it, it takes a little bit more, you know, work to make your own model from scratch. Um, and depending on the model, it could take a lot more work. Um, there's the pre-made benefits. You don't have to gather your training data yourself. You can you know, easily test different things out uh, without spending all that time. And you can very much use state-of-the-art research. You, know, you can import someone's model that, they, that a top researcher just wrote if they made it publicly available to you. Um, and they usually have some documentation and you can do that thing I mentioned earlier, like transfer learning. And just real quick, I just want to mention that Amazon Web Services, they have a bunch of free machine learning APIs. So you can actually use the one behind uh, Alexa. So it's called Amazon Lex. And then they also have Amazon Connect where you can use the same API um, that's been trained with, you know, every single time that you, let's say you have an Echo Dot right here and you talk to it. That's a, another data point going into that. And it feeds like the, the huge uh, algorithm that everyone's running and it, it keeps training it. So yeah, like you're gonna be able to, to leverage things. Like for example, you have these Google services, you have ten TensorFlow as well. And also things like uh, Amazon Lex and many other services that they have. So, you know, the possibilities are endless and you can use things that really have been billions of data points. So it's very efficient mm. and very accurate. Um, yeah, great. So. What Coco SSD, I'm not sure if it's if they pronounce it like that, um, but that's the name of the model that we're going to be using. Uh, you know, machine learning uh, programmers like to name their models because it's kind of like they're their babies, their, ch their children. Um, and this actually has a, a name that's relevant to exactly what it does. So it was trained on the Coco data set, which is about um, objects in context. Um, and I mean, you can kind of take a guess at what that means is looking at, you know, uh, any kind of thing in an image and in a certain context. So it was trained on billions of images, millions, billions, maybe. Um, and the architecture is just kind of like how the model is implemented, something called single shot detection, um, which this is more named after what it helps you do, which is given a single shot, like you know, one frame from a video of your webcam, um, it can detect something in that. And we can, you can look up like uh, the Coco data set and, you know, they even have a website. Oh, awesome. And it'll, it'll show you, and you know, a bunch of examples, the research paper about doing it. They have 80 different object categories. Yeah, 330,000 images. Um, uh, I think there was somewhere where they mentioned actually all of the, the objects that it can detect, but we can find that later. Um, uh, but yeah, for example, it can detect planes, cats, dogs, fire hydrants, boats. Um, so, all right, let's start getting set up and coding. So the other website that where you're going to actually code is on glitch.com. So open that up in a separate tab. 
next to the uh, code lab. Um, this is just going to help you, you know, instead of having to install these packages yourself and whatnot, uh, Glitch just allows you to already boot up, you know, uh, an instance of a website very easily. Um, so we're even going to use uh, pre-made uh, boilerplate code, which does anyone know what boilerplate means? Good learning opportunity. <laughs> um, a boilerplate is just like the, the the setup code, you know, like when you in Java, for example, the writing the public static void main, like that's the boilerplate. It's not actually the code that your 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 actual algorithm. It's just the stuff that needs to be there for it to work. Um, and luckily, someone's already written that boilerplate for us, so we're just going to use it. So on glitch.com, um, you actually. You don't need to log in. You can just use the search over here and look up tensorflow.js boilerplate code, or I think just boilerplate is fine. And we're gonna be using this middle one right here with the TensorFlow picture. It says the hello world for TensorFlow. Um, so once you're here, you're gonna to wanna to scroll down to the remix your own. Um, and remixing literally just means using it. You know, we're going to use the code that someone else already already made all the setup for us, um, and we're just going to make our additions to it. So the layout of the very basic setup is just so. This is actually a web page. You can see this um, by going to preview, and if you preview in a new window, you'll actually see like this is a full web page. Um, you can go here to the page source and see all of the source that's in there in the HTML. And right now, all it does is like the hello world, which is, oh, this is what version of TensorFlow you're running. Um, and these are all of the files that are necessary uh, to do that. Um, in fact, not even all of these are necessary. Like the license and readme are just, you know, explanations for you to understand what's going on. Um, <clears throat> HTML is the very basic layout of everything that's going to be on your web page um so you know you have like your your title and then you can have you can define your, your which characters you're going to be using your style sheets um any text any video any button any link um is going to be defined here in the html um the <laughs> javascript is the actual programming language that is going to power any kind of processing or algorithm that you're using. And <clears throat> your style is the, the aesthetics of it. You know, like I want to use this font, I want to use this size text, etc. If you've ever used like a, a, a Word document or a Google Doc, and you know how they have like heading one, heading two, heading three, you can specify that kind of stuff. Like this is heading one. Um, I want all of my heading ones to be of this color and font style. And then whenever I want to add, let's say I want to add another title lower down the page, I can just make that title a uh, head style heading one. And I don't have to redefine for every block of text all of its properties. Um, okay, so we've got the boilerplate set up, we've remixed the project, and we have our copy. So does anyone have any questions so far? No. Pretty basic. This is just all the stuff that you need to get the setup working and start coding. So, um, luckily, our code lab, you know, has the the code written for us. We're not going to have to be, you know, like individually writing uh, lines of code. But um, it's for for a, a workshop format. Um, we're just going to kind of go through some of the blocks and understand what they're doing, and copy paste them into our actual program. So the, the very beginning of the HTML is just defining, again, the title. Um, it's linking to the style sheet, which was the CSS that I talked about. Um, and we're going to be adding this. Uh, this is just going to be a little bit of a paragraph, uh, letting the user of your website know what it's doing um, so or what to do with it. It says, hold some objects up close to your webcam to get a real-time classification. When ready, click enable webcam below. There's going to be a button. 
and accept access to the webcam when the browser asks. Um, and then this is going to be our div, which is just kind of like the that section, the bottom section of the web page, which is going to have the button and the actual video player. And then um, at the bottom of the HTML, we're just going to import the actual TensorFlow library, with all of that code that someone else wrote for us to use, the load the model, and also um, link the actual JavaScript script that we're going to write uh, to the HTML. So all of this is in the code lab, which we're going to follow. Um, so getting populating the HTML skeleton. All of that breakdown is in all this code. So you can come here to number five on the code lab and just copy paste this into your HTML on glitch. You can copy over the boilerplate for this um, because it, it has all of the, the boilerplate in it already. And so now if you actually come here and reload your preview, if you don't have the preview open, the button is over here on the bottom. Um, if you hit refresh, this little refresh button, you should now see all of that stuff. We got the button there and we have the, the text there for the user. Everyone with me so far? Can you zoom in? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a little On the code? There we go. That's better. OK, perfect. Um, OK. So the next thing that we're going to do is add the style to the CSS. Um, like I said, this, this is going to really help with user interaction in actually using your web page. <laughs> Uh, a lot of us may think, you know, like I can just put the text there and, and whatever, they, they'll figure it out. Uh, but as, I, as I'll show uh, right now, it can really help with just very small aesthetic things, uh, giving users a clue about how to use your product. So we're going to now go into style.css and copy in the styles from the code lab. So we got the body, the heading one, the video, and the section as well as some uh, actual classes uh, over here. So the, the second block of text, you can just put that under the first block of text that we copied. Um, these are your classes. Um, so I'm trying to remember exactly what the difference between the classes and just the, these kind of headings are. Does anyone know? <clears throat> I wonder if it mentions it here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay. So classes, um, I remember now. So classes help you change different um, formats of your the things on your web page based on a given state. So you can have a class that's like, uh, oh, I want to make this text invisible. And then I have a class that makes it visible. And then on my JavaScript, I can say when this button is clicked, you know, make that text visible or make it invisible. Or, you know, like when I click this button, enable the webcam um, and make the draw the video bounding box, et cetera. So that's just what these classes are doing. Um, so I think that I get these already. Yeah, so they're in here. And so you can refresh the page. And now what you'll actually notice the differences is we made this invisible it's not actually invisible but the opacity is low the opacity is just like how a measure of how transparent it is or how not transparent it is so a low opacity means it's mostly transparent um and this is the, the thing that i was talking about with css is just by making this text transparent we're already telling the user something which means uh, you, you know this is not accessible yet this should not be your main focus and actually, the reason why we're going to do that is because loading the model takes a little bit of time for the web page. And if we have the button visible, right, while the model is still loading, what's the problem with that? Yeah, if you click it, it won't be able to load. And someone else who's using your website may just think that your website's broken <laughs> because they're like, hey, I clicked this button five times and I left because it didn't work. And then, you know, they're, 
you have to tell them, oh, well, that's because you needed to wait 10 seconds for the model to load and then it worked. So we can just simply define that CSS class that says, let's leave this invisible. And then once it's done loading, we'll make it visible. That very simple change already does a lot. Um, okay, so everybody should be here. Yeah, so this is just what they're talking about. The text and the button are unavailable because uh, by default, it has the invisible class applied. And then we're actually going to use the JavaScript to remove that invisibility. Um, so now we're going to add the JavaScript skeleton. Um, this is going to help us reference elements in the DOM. I will break that down for you, I promise. Um, yeah, we, you can remove the, the hello world stuff and just copy over it with your constant variables. Um, anyone know what DOM is or what it stands for, what it means, what it does? Um, I actually looked this up a few minutes before this because I, I kind of knew what it was, but I didn't even know exactly what it stands for. It stands for document object model. Yes. So that is like the tree structure of your HTML. So the HTML defines the layout of stuff on your page. You might have different things that are nested. You might have like, oh, I have a section of this page. And in this section, there's two buttons. Um, and then under those two buttons, there's this block of text. Um, and then I have a video. And in that video, there's you know a, a, a little play bar for the video. Um, so the DOM is essentially like a, a tree of all of the things that are on your web page. So when we're saying, you know, document get element by ID, we're actually referencing the stuff that we defined in the HTML layout. Um, so like, for example, which this one, yeah, right there, just so that oh yeah, good idea. This like this. Yeah. So. You know, and not only that, you can also find stuff on the page. So um, if I want to, have you ever seen those pages that like, as you scroll down, it loads more videos, it loads more text, et cetera. Pretty much every social media feed works like this. Um, is I can have, you know, like my, my body. And then as I scroll down, I can load more of the elements in that body. Um, so that's why it's really helpful to have this kind of tree structure. Um, and you can you can parse it and find all kinds of stuff within that as well. Okay, so yeah, like I like I was mentioning before, these elements are getting things by the ID given in the HTML. So here we give, for example, ID live view. Uh, actually, I don't know if we're using that one, but webcam I think we're definitely using. Um, it's just really helpful. This is kind of like naming the variable. Uh, for the HTML so that we can reference it and actually code with it. Um, and we're then going to, in the JavaScript, um, call that variable video. Um, but really, video references webcam in the HTML. Live view references live view. A lot of times we'll use the same name. Um, but sometimes you can be a little bit more elaborate with you know, the JavaScript, depending on what it's actually doing. Um, okay, and then we'll go back to the code lab and add in the code for checking the webcam support. So you can just copy paste this under the um, stuff that we already have. Um, and so this is, you know, doing some, this is just adding a function to, like we said, is checking if the webcam access is supported. You don't need to understand exactly how it's working. Uh, it's basically checking, um, is there a media device? Like, do you have a webcam on your computer? Because if you don't, then you probably won't be able to make a smart cam if you don't have a cam to begin with. And uh, it's just checking if it can actually get that media, you know, if it's, if it's working, basically. Um, and the other thing we're gonna do is add an event listener to the button. So the button by itself didn't do anything um, when, when we're clicking it, which like right now it's still not implemented. You can see this um, 
enable cam is still not implemented. So this button doesn't actually do anything. We just defined, hey, I want to have a button on this web page. Um, the event listener is going to tell us, is going to allow us to do something with that button. So we can say, oh, when this button is clicked, you know, we're going to listen for that event. Um, an event can be multiple things, not just click. It can be when the user types something. It can be um, when they resize the window. It can be anything. Specifically, when a user clicks the button, um, <clears throat> we're going to enable the camera, which is just called the next function, which we have not yet added. Um, and if the webcam isn't supported, we're actually going to warn them in the console, like, hey, you need a webcam. <laughs> Um, or their browser doesn't support uh, getting webcam, et cetera. Sometimes you have an outdated browser. Um, okay. And uh, lastly, we're going to fetch the actual webcam stream. Sorry, not lastly, but we will fetch the actual webcam stream and put that in enable cam. So uh, don't, don't just put it under that function prototype. You can actually overwrite that enable cam function that previously was just empty with the new code. So let me actually go through the PowerPoint, make sure that I'm still on track. Um, it's just essentially following along with the things that we're doing. We added the style and we're copying over the JavaScript. Uh, here it's a lot bigger, so you can actually see. Um, okay. So what the <clears throat> enable cam is going to do, obviously, is enable the camera. Um, we're actually also gonna add a check for, has the model finished loading? Um, if it hasn't, we don't wanna enable the camera yet because people are gonna think that our, our program isn't just working. Um, <clears throat> and then we can actually hide that button once clicked. So again, this is the, the thing with the CSS class is if we add the removed class, and we can define to make that button now invisible because it's been removed after it's clicked. You shouldn't need to click it again once it's enabled. Um, uh, the thing that we're going to actually use to activate the webcam stream is this navigator media devices, get user media. Um, and what we have to pass into that function is actually a, some constraints with the video. Um, <clears throat> so we're, for now, I mean, for this workshop, we're just using a very simple constraint, which is, hey, we need a device that can do video. So video is true. Um, but you can also look for a device with the constraints that it can do audio. If I want to have, you know, uh, some kind of like audio recording on my web page, you can put audio is true. Or you want, you know, something that can do audio and video, or you can specify a bunch of things like, uh, do I want to use the front facing camera or the back facing camera of the phone that you're on, um, how, what resolution, et cetera. Um, very simply, we're just going to take, hey, does your computer have something that can do video, which is a webcam usually. Um, and then <clears throat> given that object, we are going to um, get the stream and add the event listener for the um, the predict webcam function, which the predict webcam function is going to be the actual one where we implement the machine learning. So yeah, this is the, we had a placeholder function for the next step. Um, and then just to try stuff out, we're gonna actually pretend that the model has loaded just to check if our webcam works first things first. So going back to the code, uh, code lab, we'll close this up. Close this. I think I was here. Yes. So you can copy paste over now the predict webcam prototype or the placeholder. Um, okay, yeah, actually this this should just be working now with the webcam. So if you once you get to this step you can refresh the page and actually check, hey, is your webcam working? So oh, there, there we go. go. Let me open this in the big preview. And then you're gonna to wanna to click allow here on the top left and you can now see me. <laughs> yeah, and them and some math in the background. Um, was everyone able to get the webcam working? 
Yeah, any questions on anything? So yeah, far? any questions, anyone lost, anyone stuck? Okay, great. Well, yeah, so you can see it's actually pretty simple to get a live video stream on your browser um, with just a few lines of code. You might've thought it was a lot harder than that. Um, I definitely did. Uh, and again, this is just, for now, we're just pretending that the model is working um, so that our code will run. Uh, we can stop it now. Oh, well, it'll keep running. Um, yeah, here you go. So you can see, I think this is the guy who actually made this this workshop. So now you know. Uh, it is Jason. Jason. He looks like a Jason. <laughs> okay. So now let's actually implement some kind of machine learning because so far we haven't done anything crazy. Um, so we are going to keep scrolling down. Oh, actually go to step number eight in the code lab. Um, and now we're actually gonna load the model that we talked about. It's a predefined model that we already imported from the library. Um, and I think you will wanna copy this over the model true code. Yeah. So we're going to initialize our model to undefined. And uh, that's just because it's not there yet. And then we're going to call the function which loads it. Um, and then once that function is done running, once it's loaded, uh, then we will remove that invisible, that opacity filter on the text to, you know, let the user know, hey, it's done loading. Um, let's see, what did they say here? Yeah, pretty much the same thing I talked about. Uh, you may notice after you copy it, uh, Glitch is giving you a warning saying that Coco SSD is not defined. That's actually okay, that's normal because of what they mentioned here. It's an external object that's loaded over from the HTML script tag. Um, so it's, it's just for some reason not, rep, not finding that object, but it is there. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, so we can actually test if that works. So if we re open the page or re refresh your preview, you should see that now when you first load the page, the text is invisible. We give it some time because it's it's loading the model right now. Um, and it's, it's a pretty large file. So, and then once that model is loaded, we can click the button and it works. Um, so, you know, just very, simple attention to detail lets the user know oh hey you know clearly i shouldn't be clicking this button yet and then bam now it's loaded so <clears throat> now the next thing that we're going to do is uh actually you know use the model um which i will talk about in a second uh let's see yeah this we can this is the actual function that's written for predict webcam. So where the previous placeholder was, you can go ahead and paste in the um, predict webcam function. And uh, you can also add the var children that was in there as well. So that is the next thing here. Oh, here they go step-by-step, step. great. So you can copy, you can copy paste that entire code at once, but we're gonna go step by step and kind of talk about what it's doing. So <clears throat> the crux of the entire thing is this model.detect. You can see, <clears throat> this is why it's great to use a library because we're, we're really calling this one function. Is <clears throat> use the model that we already imported and loaded and uh, call detect on the video stream that we have. Um, and then we're going to, do some stuff with that detection um, once we have the actual output of the model because our model if the if you remember that neural network picture that we showed before what the model is actually outputting is not the is not it's not giving you back the exact same video stream with the bounding boxes etc right We're, we have to do that code ourselves um, it's actually just giving you the coordinates um, of some stuff and the confidence, et cetera. But you have to actually show that to the user in a way that makes sense. 
Uh, you, you don't want to just have a console application that's like, oh, this is the coordinates of the dog in your picture. And they're like, I don't know what that means, right? So <clears throat> what we're going to go ahead and do is, um, so again, the goal, the overarching goal, which actually, since we actually finished copy pasting the code, we should be able to test and see that it's working. Um, so let's wait for the model to load. Great, so I am 90% a person. <laughs> uh, and so person. Yeah, so is he. <laughs> Hopefully so are you. Right, we don't have yeah, any aliens in this room. Wait, let me see if I just put my hand. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a person. <laughs> um, stand next to me doesn't do two people. Yeah, you can actually oh, yeah, do multiple is. objects in the same frame. Oh, nice. So uh, it's working. Yeah, and is there anything? See, this is why I wanted the list of objects it can detect. I think it can do phones as well. So oh, sweet. this water is my bottle. cell phone. Water bottle? Uh, water bottle, maybe. Maybe. Wait. Oh, yeah. Wait, oh, what did it say? Oh, yeah, it says bottle. No, cell phone. Here, <laughs> Wait, maybe if you just cell phone. <laughs> oh, bottle. Yeah. Bottle. Yeah, Eighty percent confidence. Nice. Uh, the text is kind of small, so you may not have seen it, but it did predict that that was a bottle. Yeah, has everybody gotten to this point on their computer? It's working. It doesn't detect you. <laughs> maybe you may be an alien. You may be a machine. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah. Um, obviously, right now, all we, all we did was copy paste the code, but I wanted to oh, actually okay. talk about how it works. I guess I just need someone. Yeah, I need someone next to you. I need someone else. Because the goal is for us to understand how does this actually work so that you can use it in your own application. Um, so, as I said, the model is just going to give us, you know, a list of coordinates and um, the confidence. So we're actually going to do the highlighting for ourselves. And the specifically what the input takes in is just the frame of video. Um, because you know it's very difficult to train something on like a, an, an actual video stream. It's, it's more like we go through each individual frame of that video. And in each picture, we draw the new bounding box. So um, that's what gives us that kind of like you know, behavior that it's updating every frame. And if you do that fast enough, then it looks like it's tracking something, but it's not actually tracking. It's just detecting the object in each image. Um, so for that, the first thing we want to do for each frame is to remove the highlighting from the previous frame. We don't want to keep drawing over and over with bounding boxes until like our entire video is covered. Uh, we want to remove those. Um, and the bounding box, like I said, is just the coordinates, and we're going to have the width and the height as well. Um, that's you. You need four numbers to define a rectangle uh, because you need to know where it is and how big it is. Uh, you could also define it in some other ways, like you could have a, you know, the top left x y coordinate and the bottom right x coordinate. But regardless, you'll need four numbers, and this is how uh, TensorFlow does it. So we are then going to have the output of all the predictions, all of their coordinates. Um, and that is going to go into, uh, let's see. Yeah, so the way this code actually works, because if you're not familiar with JavaScript, this might look a little bit confusing. So let me go back and emphasize this. What this is doing is not only running a function, but that function also has its own um, outputs. And then we're going to take those outputs from the detect function um, and use that as the input into a different function. So this function is taking in the input predictions um, and you know doing some code with that. So we have that input or we have that output from our model and we're using that as an input. So we have this variable predictions, which is just an array of everything that we found, that we detected. And what we're doing is we're just checking, hey, 
is our confidence over 66 percent um you know if the confident is if the confidence is low enough then if you know if if i say hey tell me everything that you think is like one percent a person might like highlight everything because you know there's always some kind of margin of error so if we're at least a little bit confident then let's actually show the bounding box otherwise let's just not show it um and so if we are sure that we classified it right let's draw the bounding box so we create an element called p um and the yeah the p i don't remember yeah p is just going to be our actual bounding box and we're going to have the inner text which is the text that showed over here yeah, we're going to define this inner text, which where it shows person with 82% confidence. So I can zoom. This is where we're defining the inner text that keeps updating every frame. So actually, if you see, if I move fast enough, you know, it's not able to find it because each frame is just a blur. Um, but if I keep my hand still, you know, it, it has enough time to update it um, because it's probably going like 30 frames per second. And, uh, okay. Um, then we're actually going to just define the width. We, we, we put the confidence text in the top part. Um, and we have the styles for to make it look nice, to color it in that nice green orange. Um, and then we just define the margins and the widths of the box. Uh, then we actually draw the box with that highlighter class that we mentioned before, which is just a class of CSS that defines, you know, a, a green, slightly transparent, um, you know, box. And then we are just actually applying it to the HTML. So the way the web page works essentially is the HTML is just a layout. And then given the JavaScript's calculations, we then kind of like write into that HTML layout and update it each time. So we're updating it with all of the new information that we have. Um, we're adding the new children to the live view um, and pushing them to the next children. I'm uh, actually not 100% sure exactly how this is working. I don't remember which variables are which. Let me see. I have a feeling that this is uh, just proceeding to kind of like the next frame in the loop. Um, just adding stuff to the new live view, uh, but I'm not 100% sure so I can talk about that or I can put out a message a little bit later on exactly what that those lines of code are doing. Um, and what else have we got? And then, <clears throat> so this is the actual function that requests the you know animation on each frame so that is just going to be constantly called um after every loop like every loop iteration um and pretty much that's it you know it works it wasn't anything too complicated we're just implementing a library that someone else used uh so you know we could talk about working at every layer of abstraction so we're actually working at a pretty abstract high level layer is just using this model and building on top of that but the really nice thing is that with that you know in just an hour you can add on to that and build something else with it so three lines of code for the actual machine learning the rest was mostly drawing the bounding boxes and the browser checks but um that's that's what libraries are for you know it's to make your job easier so that you can do more um, and not have to start over from scratch. Um, so <laughs> what's next? Uh, quick recap of what we've done. We learned the benefits of TensorFlow and using pre-made models, uh, making a fully working web page pretty much from, from scratch uh, on Glitch. It kind of you know has all that set up for you and doing all the following things. Which I'm not gonna list every single one. So, I want everyone to think about how you can extend this to something that's useful in your life. Um, actually, does anyone have any ideas right off the bat? Yeah. 
Is this not Apple like kind of makes makes for face ID, or is it like make it a more specific version of this? Yeah, yeah, it's the same general idea pretty much. Um, and they, you know, instead of so when you first set up the face ID, it says like, oh, put your face here and then turn it around a little bit and kind of like show it to the camera. That's just training a different model. You know, they're not using, they don't already know what your face looks like. You have to like train the model yourself. Um, and once that model is trained, they implement it and they, they detect it. So yeah, for some kind of face ID, like you could, if you want to, have a, use like an old phone or a, a Raspberry Pi if you're more advanced, put it outside your door, you know, hook it up to maybe a smart lock and make a face ID, but for your actual door of your room or your house. Um, so that's, that's something that would look really cool. You know, not a lot of people have that. Um, be careful with that because someone might think to print out a picture of your face and then show it to the lock uh, and they might be able to get into your house, but you know, do something, do something less risky than that. Uh, any other ideas? I would say generally more the idea of security. So I can implement their house. I think this is pretty useful for them in terms of not recognizing the pseudo object, which is very simple to control. So, oh, yeah, totally. The, the security camera footage thing that you mentioned earlier, that's very useful. Yeah, that's like maybe um, if you need to set up security in an area and you know that in a certain time, let's say 3 a.m., there's no cars should be passing by that area. If it detects a car, then, you know, it calls the police or something like that. So, yeah, but red light traffic that cameras work that way. What? <laughs> the one unfortunate car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can it detect like how big people are? Like if it's skinnier like that? A different model could totally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this model is just doing a simple rectangle. So it's not, it's not outlining your exact you know figure but you, you could you could do all sorts of things with that like you could you know given that code you could detect how large the width is or the height of someone um so so go out and do something with this you know that that's where the real magic happens is you you got the foundation you got the building blocks and now actually build something with it um and then share what you make with us and with the TensorFlow JS people, because they they like seeing that. They like knowing that's like, hey, this library of code that we use, people are using it. You know, that's that's what we made it for. Um, so I will definitely go out and and try something like that. Um, and uh, I just want to share. Thank one you. Thing. Yeah. Um, there was another um, project by someone that I know. She's a master's student here, and she did something where it like makes a skeleton frame of you, right? So so you just stand in front of the camera and then it makes a skeleton frame of you. And based on how you walk, it detects like um, like if you have any sort of ailments, like back problems and stuff, like if you lean more on one side and stuff like that. Yeah, I heard about so, that. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Really cool stuff. The, the possibilities are literally endless. Um, like I also, I did some research two years ago or three um, where, we're doing anomaly detection for of crimes. So not just like, <clears throat> is there a gun in this frame, but is there, you know, a fire or a or an explosion somewhere in like a you 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 may want to know if there's any kind of fire or explosion uh anywhere near a nuclear power plant, for example. You know, that's something that you want to be able to detect very quickly and accurately. Um <clears throat> and if that happens at three in the morning, there might not be a security, uh, you know, guard at there watching the live feed at that moment. So that's something that you want to know about. <clears throat> so <clears throat> be creative. You can do a lot with this. And a big thanks for coming out. Does anyone have any questions? Was everyone able to follow along and actually get it working? I was it good? <clears throat> Ooh, uh, which part were you stuck on? I can I can help you debug that so don't worry we'll I'll help you after this <clears throat> any other questions idea oh yes oh yeah totally um <clears throat> are you that's cool are you doing that here at UCF Oh. With an organization that's thinking like, 
Um, that I'll be wow, awesome. Is that like vision based or is it using sensors or something? Uh, vision based. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. So yeah, this this will be helpful, <laughs> hopefully. Um, <clears throat> there's other ways to implement this. You don't have to use TensorFlow. There are other machine learning libraries out there. Like I think uh, there's PyTorch, Keras. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch of them, but you know, TensorFlow is one of them. And now you kind of know an idea of how to use it. Um, you can do a lot more than just this. You know, this is just the the building blocks, the foundation of what you can do. Yeah, and as we said earlier, you can also train your own things. You can build models from scratch. They're very, very customizable too. So you can have all types of um, neural networks. You can have different forms of them. You can customize their size and their different strengths and everything. So it's very customizable. It's a really great library if you want to give it to you. Great. So no other questions. Anyone from Zoom? Um, the GDSC sign-in link, I put it in the Zoom chat for Zoom people, and then it is also on the Discord. Google Zoom Developer Club Discord. The events the, resources. Yeah, the event resources chat. There's a thread that says AIUCF. You just click there, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so if you didn't fill that out and you're part of the GDSC, then go ahead and do so, so we can make sure you're accounted for it. Great. Well, yeah, thank you all for coming out. You know, this has been really good. I had fun. Uh, learning about this myself um, and showing it to you all. And I want to see what people can create with this. So make sure to tag us in, on Discord and tweet about it, whatever you want to do. <laughs> Thank you for coming, everyone. See ya. <laughs>